Hello and welcome to 3ABN Sabbath School panel. I'm John Lomacang, joined with a host of family and friends that you may know very, very well here at 3ABN. We're talking about today, Taken and Tried, lesson number 11. And we're gonna be breaking that down in five individual parts. To my immediate left is evangelist, speaker, singer, Ryan Day. Good to have you here, Ryan. What day are you covering? Amen. I, I've got Monday's lesson and I, the Monday's lesson is entitled, The Last Supper. Okay, wow. Can you invite me? Of course, okay. always. <laughs> and, We're gonna wash feet though. I've uh, washed my feet. Okay, I'll, I'll be glad to be there. And Jill, always good to have you here. What's Th your day? Thank you, Pastor John. On Tuesday, we look at Gethsemane. Gethsemane. Wow. What a, what a focus. Mm -hmm. Pastor Dindy, what are you covering for us today? It's a blessing to be here. I have Wednesday, a strange title, Leaving All to Flee from Jesus. Mm -hmm. And uh, teacher, Professor Daniel Perrin. Got Thursday's lesson of who are you? Hmm. A very significant question. So you might be thinking about uh, who you are today. You know, I remember when Jesus asked Peter, who do men say that I, the son of man am? Well, if you'd like to get a copy of our Sabbath School notes, you can go to ssp at 3abn.org and request copies of the lesson. Once you sign up, you are on the list. You don't have to continue to send the request in over and over and the list is growing. So you might want to be one of those who add yourself. You know, sometimes we cover the lesson in detail and sometimes our notes are, we start out with it and then the Lord guides us someplace else. So you might be getting a distilled version of what we're covering or you might get the entire kit and caboodle. But nonetheless, we hope to be able to be a blessing to you in whatever way we can. Before we go any farther though, we'll start with prayer. Ryan, would you have our prayer for us? Sure. Father in heaven, Lord, we ask that you bless this time together as we open your word and we learn of you. We learn of your ways, your truth, and uh, we take on this most solemn uh, lesson, Lord, which is uh, on the last moments of Christ's life. Um, and Lord, we just thank you for the opportunity for us to be able to have the religious f and liberty and freedom to be able to mm -hmm. study. Be with all of those watching, Lord, and draw us all to you. We ask in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Now, this lesson taken and tried, it's another one of the sandwich parables in the book of Mark, chapter 14. If you have your Bibles, go there with me. I'm going to read the note that the writer of this lesson included. And uh, the, the overall title is Taken and Tried. But we'll start with our memory text, Mark, chapter 14 and verse 36. Let's look at that together. Mark 14, verse 36, and the Bible says, um, And he said, Abba, Father, all things are possible for you. Take this cup away from me. Nevertheless, not what I will, but what you will. We've heard other versions of that. Nevertheless, not my will, but thy will be done. And uh, when we think about that, the overall view of this lesson is taken and tried. Obviously, you can tell exactly to whom that's referring. That's referring to Jesus being taken and tried. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, you think about it. If you think that you've had a difficult week, just go through the week that Jesus had before he so lovingly gave his life to save you and me. A different difficult week. But let me make a very important point. No one took his life. He laid it down. Right. He laid it down lovingly, voluntarily. He took what belongs to us so that we can receive what belongs to him exclusively. He walked our road so that one day we can walk his road. He wore our crown of thorns that one day we can wear his crown of glory. He wore our robe of shame that one day we might be able to share his robe of righteousness. So when it says taken and tried, we should have been taken and we should have been tried, but we know the end result of that would be we are not righteous enough to save ourselves. Praise God that Jesus was willing to be taken and tried, that one day we can be taken to the kingdom and no longer tried because we'll be exonerated by the blood of the lamb. A comment brought out by the lesson uh, author, I'll read this very carefully. He says, this week's lesson focuses on Mark 14. And we'll break that, on, break that down into pieces. Beginning with the fifth sandwich story which interlinks two opposite actions in relation to Jesus. This is followed by the Last Supper, followed by his struggle in Gethsemane. 
There he is arrested and taken before the leaders to be tried. The trial scene is linked with Peter's denial of Jesus, forming the sixth and last of the sandwich stories of Mark. Again, two opposite actions occur, but by an iconic, by an ironic twist, they affirm the same truth. So let's start in Mark chapter 14, and I'll read verses 1 to 11 and share one of the unforgettable stories that were shared by Mark in this chapter. The Bible says, After two days it was the Passover and the Feast of Unleavened Bread. And the chief priests and the scribes sought how they might take him by trickery and put him to death. But they said, Not during the feast, lest there be an uproar of the people. And being in Bethany at the hour of Simon the leper, as he sat at the table, a woman came having an alabaster flask, a very costly oil of spikenard. Then she broke the flask and poured it on his head. But there were some who were indignant among themselves and said, Why was this fragrant oil wasted? You can be sure that Judas was one of them. <laughs> for it might have been sold for more than 300 denarii and given to the poor. And they criticized her sharply. But Jesus said, Let her alone. Why do you trouble her, the great defender of the weak? Mm -hmm. She had done a good work for me. For you have the poor with you always. And wherever you wish, and, whatever, and wherever you wish, you may do them good. But me, you do not have always. She has done what she could. She has come beforehand to anoint my body for burial. Assuredly, I say to you, wherever this gospel is preached in the whole world, what this woman has done will also be told as a memorial to her. Mm. Then Judas Iscariot, one of the twelve, went to the chief priest to betray him to them. And when they heard it, they were glad and promised to give him money. So he sought how he might conveniently betray him. You know, when I read that uh, panel, I thought, how do you conveniently betray Jesus? You know, you find that word uh, in the Bible uh, when Paul was uh, proclaiming the message, the one to whom he was speaking said, I'll, I'll, wait for, I'll look for a more convenient time. There's no convenient way to betray mm. Jesus. That, that, that word just, I could not get it out of my mind. Convenient way? Yeah. You mean you can betray him without being noticed? You can betray him without it being linked to you? Uh, you can do it kind of, uh, how would we say, vicariously? No, there is no way that you can betray Jesus without it being linked directly to your heart and to your life. So the question that was posed is, what two stories are intertwined here and how do they play off of one another. Let's start with the first one. It's called Two Unforgettable Events Intertwined, The Woman That Anoints Jesus. Now, I notice as, as we go to Mark chapter 14, verses 8 and 9, what I notice about this very significantly, very quickly, is the highlight is not her name, but her action. And so when I thought about that, some people do a lot of things to get their name out there. They want their names to become public, their names to become famous. But what I noticed right away is what we do must be more important than who we are. And that was the motivating force behind this woman's life. She didn't come in d describing herself and, and naming herself and, you know, I'm here and giving her name to precede her. She came almost unnoticed. But the action that she took was what the Lord noted. In verses 8 and 9, it says, She has done what she could. She has come beforehand to anoint my body for burial. Assuredly, I say to you, wherever this gospel is preached in all the world, the whole world, what this woman has done, what this woman has done will also be told as a memorial to her. And notice, her action precedes her identity. And when what we do becomes more important than who we are, the point that I came out with, then to Jesus, who we are becomes as important as what we do. Notice that if our actions are more important than our name, then Jesus, is, Jesus begins to tie our actions to our names. He does not ignore us 
what this woman has done will also be told as a memorial to her. And there were three questions that were very importantly posed here, and I'd like to bring them out. Do we do what we do to be remembered for who we are? Or do we do what we do to remember Jesus for who he is? The second one, what is the motive behind our service for Christ? What motivates us to do what we do for Christ? If it's visibility and notoriety, then we're doing it for the wrong reason. The third thing, are God's entrusted gifts being used to rob him of his exclusive glory? And that may be the case for some of us. We may be using his gift to rob him of his glory. I think about the way that it's seen in the social media world. You know, so many people are posting and we remember their names and uh, we begin to lose sight of the real reason why this platform is put there. Now, I can't say there's a good reason, but I think that those of us who have uh, accountability as Christians, we should use it for the glory of the Lord. And I've, I've, I've taken a, a specific approach specifically on Facebook. Uh, outside of posting something for family reasons, most, or, most everything I post is for the purpose of leading someone to know more about Christ. And so that's a vitally important thing. So let's look at the principles of ministry here. If I could get through them, let's look at the ministry of the, of the unobstructed. Let's go to John chapter 3, verse 30. The ministry of the unobstructed. John chapter 3, verse 30. Does anyone have that? I do. You have that, Jill? Could you read that for us? He must increase, but I must decrease. Notice what happens here. We decrease, but Christ increases. So if you're doing what you do t for you to increase, then you are becoming the person who is obstructing the ministry of Christ rather than participating in the ministry of the unobstructed. The second one is the ministry of delayed acclamation. Look at 1 Peter 5 and verse 6. The ministry of delayed benefits if you cannot grab the word acclamation. 1 Peter 5, verse 6. Therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you in due time. So let's wait. Do what we do not for self-gratification or self-glory, but do it that the Lord in his time may bring us to notoriety. The third thing is the ministry of self-abasement. Matthew 23 and verse 12. And whoever exalts himself will be humbled and he who humbles himself will be exalted. And finally, the ministry of self-abasement. Now, I, I refer to this because so many people do what they do to get position in life. But when you follow Christ, it's not about position. Notice what Mark chapter 10 and verse 31 says. But many of you who are first will be last, and the last will be first. So I pray that the motive behind your ministry is not you but Christ. Amen. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Pastor. My name is Ryan Day. I have uh, lesson number 11, which is entitled, um, or excuse me, Monday's lesson on lesson number 11, which is entitled The Last Supper. And, uh, you know, as I was going through this particular lesson, um, for whatever reason, my brain just switched into this mode of trying to understand and put myself kind of through the journey of what the disciples experienced that night prior to obviously the crucifixion of Christ. So Thursday evening, uh, leading into obviously the, the night, the, the late morning hours um, of the uh, of this uh, crucifixion preliminary, which is Gethsemane and the Last Supper and all this that's going on. What I want to do is just kind of walk you through what the disciples would have went through. I studied this extensively. I went to all the gospels and I tried to piece what I believe to be uh, an accurate uh, chronological series of events that happened uh, uh, leading up to, from, from the point where they actually sat down and had the meal uh, all the way through leading up to Gethsemane. And so um, our journey begins in John chapter 13, verses 1 and 2. We see here that uh, the night began, obviously, Jesus had previous to this, uh, he had given specific instruction to the disciples to go prepare a specific area, a specific place for the Passover meal. And so it says here in John chapter 13, verse 1 and 2, now before uh, the feast of Passover, when Jesus knew that, his, that uh, his hour had come, that he should depart from this world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. And notice what it says, and supper being ended. So notice they had the meal, the general Passover meal, but a 
immediately following the Passover meal, uh, we find an interesting series of events taking place. And you can see what all happens and really what makes this, this Lord's Supper event so special because Jesus is giving his final words, his final teachings to his disciples before he's going to be nailed to a cross. I'm going to jump over now to Luke 22, verses 24 to 27, because this is where a dispute breaks out. This is after the meal, a dispute breaks out among the disciples, which leads Jesus to now begin washing some feet. And so notice what it says here in Luke chapter 22, verse 24 to 27. It says, now there was also a dispute among them as to which of them should be considered the greatest. And he said to them, the kings of the Gentiles exercise lordship over them. And those who exercise authority over them are called benefactors, but not so among you. On the contrary, he who is greatest among you, let him be as the younger and he who governs as he who serves for who is greater, he who sits at the table or he who serves. Jesus is twisting their whole cultural mentality around and he says, it is not he who sits at the table, yet I am among you as the one who serves. And then of course, now you can imagine as John chapter 13 verses three through 17 paints very, very vividly this picture in our mind of Jesus taking a, a, a towel. He girds himself and begins to lean down and begin to wash the disciples' feet. Notice what the scripture says here. Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he had come from God and was going to God, rose from the supper and laid aside his garments, took a towel and girded himself. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel uh, with which he was girded. Then he came to Simon Peter and Peter said, said to him, Lord, are you washing my feet? Uh, Jesus answered and said to him, what I am doing, you do not understand now, but you will know after this. Peter said to him, you shall never wash my feet. And Jesus answered and said to him, if I do not wash you, you have no part with me. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. And Jesus said to him, he who is bathed needs only to wash his feet, but is completely clean. And you are clean, but not all of you, speaking of Judas, obviously, for he knew who would betray him. Therefore, he said, you are not all clean. But then notice what's happening here in verses 12 and onward. I love this lesson here. He says, so when he had washed their feet, taken his garments and sat down again, he said to them, do you know what I have done to you? You call me teacher and Lord and you say, well, for so I am. If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you should do as I have done to you. Most assuredly, I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master, nor is he who, who is sent greater than he who sent him. If you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. So Jesus is teaching them humility. It's amazing how these guys have been with him three and a half years. They've seen the miracles. They've heard the teachings. They've seen this humble man over and over transform and change people's lives. And yet in the moments before he's going to be arrested, what are they doing? Uh, arguing with one another, their pride, their selfishness, just pouring out, arguing with one another, who's going to be the greatest in God's kingdom. And you could just vividly imagine Imagine in your mind's eye and your brain that Jesus just doesn't even say a word. He just leans down with a towel girded around him. He takes the water and he begins to wash their feet and he begins to show them, this is the spirit which I want you to lead. This is the spirit you must have if you're going to serve me. You have to be able to humble yourself to love one another enough to put yourself in a position of lower than someone else, a servant, even if you may, as Jesus says, he rightly so, you say, I am your teacher. I am your master. But even the master was willing to serve. And that should be our heart as well. And of course, if you read the scriptures appropriately, the next thing that would occur, of course, is this, what we call the Lord's Supper, the communion service. We read this in our key text here, Mark chapter 14 and verse 22 to 25. We also see the equivalent passages in Matthew 26, 26 to 29 and Luke 22, 17 to 20. It says here, as they were eating, Jesus took bread, blessed and broke it and gave it to them and said, take eat. This is my body. Then he took the cup and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and they all drank from it. And he said to them, this is 
my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for many. Assuredly, I say to you, I will no longer drink of the fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new in the kingdom of God. So Jesus is saying this represents my body that's going to be broken for all mankind. This cup of wine, this cup of grape juice represents the, uh, the blood that I am going to shed for you and for all mankind. We're going to make some more comments about that in just a moment. But then right immediately after this, if you continue to study in John chapter 13, verses 18 to 30, also Matthew 26, 21 to 15, uh, excuse me, uh, Matthew 26, 21 and onward, and then Mark chapter 14, 18 through 20, and Luke 22, 21 to 23, this is where Jesus clearly identifies Judas as his betrayer. And of course, Judas gets up and leaves and he says, what you do, go do quickly. Uh, and of course, at this moment, now after Jesus has completed and he has acknowledged his uh, betrayer, if you continue to study the scriptures, now Peter, uh, Jesus talks about how uh, all of them will be scattered this night. And what does Peter do there in Matthew 26, 31, uh, 31 to 35? And Mark talks about this. Luke talks about this. John, they all mention Peter's denial uh, in which Peter speaks. Oh, Lord, no, I'm never going to deny you. You? And Jesus says, no, you, you don't know that even this very night before the rooster crows, you would have denied me three times. And uh, they all get up, Matthew and even Mark says that they sing a hymn and then they made their way to Gethsemane. And it's interesting to note this, many people don't catch this, but the latter portions of John 13, all of John 14, all of John 15, all of John 16 and even all of John 17 is happening as they're on their way to Gethsemane. Jesus gives them a whole discourse, well, five chapters of teaching on their way to Gethsemane. And then, of course, uh, by the time you see there in uh, Matthew chapter 26 and verse 30 and there verses 36 through 56, Mark talks about this. Luke talks about this. John talks about this, about how when they got to Gethsemane, that's when Jesus pled for them to pray because he knew his time was that he knew that when Judas left the table, mm -hmm. that Judas was on his way to go gather the men that would then arrest him and take him onto a cross. You know, all of this message here of what Jesus went through reminds me of what we see here in Isaiah chapter 53, mm -hmm. verses four through eight. Surely he has borne our griefs. When you talk about his body, that bread representing his body, that, that cup of, of wine, that new wine representing his blood. It says that he carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. Mm -hmm. He was bruised for our iniquities. Mm -hmm. The chastisement of our peace was upon him and by his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We've turned every one to our own way. And the Lord has laid upon him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was crucified and he opened not his mouth. He was led as a lamb to the slaughter and as a sheep before its shearers are silent. So he opened not his mouth mouth. Hmm. My friends, keep that on your mind as you com comprehend and, and contemplate on those events prior to the cross. Jesus already knew that he was laying down his life to save you and to save me. And so I want to encourage you that as we are preparing to transition from now Monday's lesson into Tuesday's lesson, the Last Supper is just not some wheelie needy little meal that they had. Uh, it was highly representative of the beautiful sacrifice that Jesus gave for you and me. Otherwise, we wouldn't be here to talk about it. Wow, thank you, Ryan. Wonderful, wonderful. We're going to take a break and uh, come right back. But as we, just before we leave, if you want the study notes, remember SSP at 3ABN.org. Don't go away. We'll be right back. Ever wish you could study more deeply along with the 3ABN Sabbath School panel members? Well, now you can. Just send an email request to ssp at 3abn.org and we'll email you the Sabbath School panelist notes on a weekly basis to enhance your own study of God's Word. That address again is ssp at 3abn.org. We'd love to send you their notes just as they've prepared them. Thank you for watching and thank you for being part of our 3ABN Sabbath School panel family. Welcome back to 3ABN Sabbath School. We now go to Jill Morricone for the lesson, Gethsemane.
Thank you so much, Pastor John and Ryan. What an incredible study this week. Ryan, I especially like the chronology of that and the order of how those events occurred. They are Thursday night, the Last mm -hmm. Supper, and then leading up to Gethsemane. The Passover, the Last Supper is over, as Ryan has explained so clearly. And Jesus and his disciples left the walled city of Jerusalem. They would have headed across the Kidron Valley on their way to the Mount of Olives. About 10 years ago, Greg and I had the privilege of going to Israel, walking down the hill, coming to Gethsemane and seeing that location. Olive trees are there where Jesus had this last great battle before he went to the cross. He had been instructing his disciples, as Ryan talked about, John chapter 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, these last instructions before he went to the cross. But now he falls strangely silent. We pick up the story in Mark 14. Turn with me there. Mark 14, verse 32. The Garden of Gethsemane is where this last great battle between Christ and Satan is fought. It's where the fate of humanity was decided. Christ tasted death for every man. He was the substitute for our sin. He experienced the agony of separation from his father and he submitted to his father's will. Three times he asked the question, Father, if it's possible, let this cup pass from me, but not my will, but your will be done. He submitted to his father's will, and that will was a no. It was a no to his human desire, and he accepted that and went to the cross for you and for me. So let's pick this up, Mark 14, verse 32. Then they came to a place which was named Gethsemane, and he said to his disciples, Sit here while I pray. Now, Gethsemane in Hebrew means oil press. The olives would be pressed to release the oil or the juices. When we talk about the pressing, us as Christians today, why are we pressed? We're pressed to become more like Jesus, are we not? Mm -hmm. Hebrews chapter 12 says, for whom the Lord loves, he corrects. We're pressed to even reveal Jesus as the man who was born blind in John chapter nine, who sinned, this man or his parents, neither, but that the glory of God could be revealed through that pressing experience. But what happened when Jesus was pressed? He bore the weight of humanity's sins. He was pressed so much that he uh, sweated great drops of blood. He was pressed because he bore the separation from his father, our sins upon him. He was pressed, he took our place. Mm -hmm. Now in ancient Israel, when they pressed olives, it was a three part pressing. The first pressing was used for holy purposes, lamps to light the sanctuary, the anointing oil. The second pressing was used for medicinal purposes, medicine used for healing. The third pressing was used for soap. Now, I don't want to take this too far, but you think there's two prayer, three prayers that Jesus had there in the Garden of Gethsemane. The first prayer, the first pressing, as it were, was for a holy purpose. He is holy. He bore our sin so that we could be forgiven. Isaiah 53, verse 6, the Lord laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was the perfect substitute. There was no sin in him. The second pressing or the second prayer, remember, was for medicinal healing. Isaiah 53, 5, with his stripes, you and I are healed. Mm -hmm. The third pressing for soap. You think about David's prayer in Psalm 51, wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. What washes us from sin? The blood of Jesus mm -hmm. cleanses us from all sin. Take away number one, Jesus walked into the olive press for me. Let's read the next verse, verse 33. He took Peter, James, and John with him, and he began to be troubled and deeply distressed. The weight of the sins of the world began to press him. Isaiah 53, 5, he was wounded for our transgressions, bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. Takeaway number two, Jesus carried the weight of sin for me. That's right. 
Next verse, verse 34. Then he said to them, my soul is exceedingly sorrowful, even to death. Stay here and watch. Now we see a spatial separation at the garden entrance. Jesus left the disciples and he took with him Peter, James, and John. They were the ones who had witnessed the transfiguration. They were those disciples closest to him. But he goes even farther from these three disciples and he presses on even further. At this moment, Jesus is experiencing the weight of the sins of the world and that separation from his father. He's always been one with the Father from eternity. I cannot imagine what that felt like, that separation. This is from Desire of Ages, page 686. He felt that by sin, he was being separated from his Father. The gulf was so broad, so deep, so black that his spirit shuddered before it. As man, he must endure the wrath of God against transgression. He truly became our substitutionary sacrifice. He took our sin and was suffering that divine justice. Another quote from Desire of Ages, page 693. Could mortals have viewed the amazement of the angelic host as in silent grief they watched the Father separating his beams of light, love, and glory from his beloved Son, they would better understand how offensive in his sight is sin. Mm -hmm. Takeaway three, Jesus endured separation from God from me. Mm -hmm. The next verse, he went a little farther and fell on the ground and prayed if it were possible that this could pass from him. He said, Abba, Father, all things are possible for you. Take this cup from me. Nevertheless, not what I will, but thy will be done. This is the ultimate surrender. That cup of suffering, the cup of God's indignation and wrath that he was holding, trembling in the balance, the ultimate surrender, surrendering to his father's will. And what was God's answer? No, you need to go to the cross because for this purpose you came to earth. Take away number four, Jesus accepted God's no because of me. The next verse, verse 37, he came back to his disciples. He found them sleeping. And he said to Peter, are you sleeping? Could you not watch with me one hour? Watch and pray lest you enter into a temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. He who had been intercessor for others, he now longed for an intercessor for himself. Isaiah 63, verse three, I've trodden the winepress alone and with the people, there was none with me. Takeaway number five, Jesus walked alone for me. The next verse, verse 39. He went away and prayed and spoke the same words. He's asking again, please, if it's possible, let this pass from me. Luke tells us he sweated great drops of blood. Desire of Ages 690. He sees this helplessness of men. He sees the power of sin. The woes and lamentations of the doomed world rise before him. He beholds the impending fate and the decision is made. He will save man at any cost to himself. He accepts the baptism of blood. Isaiah 53, 12, he poured out his soul to death. Takeaway number six, Jesus chose me over his own life. And then we know Luke tells us an angel appeared from heaven strengthening him. Going back to the concluding section in Mark 14, 41 and 42, he comes back the third time. Are you still sleeping? It is enough, the hour has come. The Son of Man is being betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us be going. My betrayer is at hand. Takeaway number seven. He obeyed his father implicitly. He had come through a difficult experience, an experience you and I will never have to face. He surrendered completely to his father, willing to walk forward and drink the cup. So I just want to tell you, he did all this for you. He left heaven for you. He went to the cross for you. He loves you. Open up your heart and receive him. Amen. Amen. Powerful. Praise the Lord. We uh, continue 
in Wednesday's portion of the lesson, Leaving All to Flee from Jesus. My name is John Dinsey, and we continue in Mark chapter 14. Now, the lesson says to begin with verse 43, but I need to begin at verse uh, 42, taking you back. Now, Jesus had made his decision to die for us. And considering this agony that is beyond our human understanding, uh, Jesus, at this point, having made his decision, he is uh, serene, calm. And now in verse 42, uh, he says, rise, let us be going, see my betrayer is at hand. Jesus knew what was going to happen, but for some reason, he didn't tell the disciples, hey, the betrayer's coming, there's danger, flee for your lives, uh, leave as soon as possible because they're coming and run for your lives. He didn't say that. For some reason, he wanted the disciples to be there. And I uh, bring to your attention this in John chapter 13, verses 26 to 30. I'll read it quickly because we will have a lot to cover. Jesus answered, it is he to whom I shall give a piece of bread when I have dipped it. And having dipped the bread, he gave it to Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon. Now, after the piece of bread, Satan entered him. Then Jesus said to him, what you do, do quickly. But no one at the table knew for what reason he said this to him. For some thought because Judas had the money box that Jesus had said to him, buy those things we need for the feast or that he should give something to the poor. Having received the piece of bread, he then went out immediately and it was night. So a powerful thought there, it was night. Now, it seems that the disciples were not fully aware that Judas would be the betrayer. They didn't know for sure. Uh, so I suggest to you that this may be a reason why Jesus did not tell the disciples, run for your lives. Mm -hmm. He wanted them to consider the fulfillment of prophecy mm -hmm. that one of his own would betray him. Let's go ahead and continue in verse uh, Mark 14, 43. And immediately while he was still speaking, Judas, one of the 12, with a great multitude with swords and clubs, came from the chief priests and scribes and the, el uh, and the elders. Now, Satan wanted to make this as difficult as possible for Jesus. Mm -hmm. He convinced one of the disciples, Judas, to betray him. You know, having made his decision at the Garden of Gethsemane, now Jesus had to face the reality. He could have, he could have said, you know, I, I'm not going to die for these people at the Garden of Gethsemane. He could have just left, but he chose to stay there. Now he's facing the reality of his decision to die for us. He stood there and faced his accusers and those and, and Judas that would betray him. Now, uh, it says in verse 44, now his betrayer had given them a signal saying, whomever I kiss, he is the one. Seize him and lead him away safely. In other words, get him quick, get him quick before he gets away. Uh, verse 45, as soon as he had come, immediately he went up to him and said to him, Rabbi, Rabbi, and kissed him. Now, it appears that Judas disconnected himself from the mob, uh, appearing to uh, be his friend. And uh, one, one commentary that I was uh, listening to or, or read said that this kiss was like a repeated kiss as a friend. I am a friend. Uh, Rabbi, my master, my master. Uh, but then that was the signal. So that's why you see in verse 46, then they laid their hands on him and took him. This laying hands on him is a rude mm -hmm. type of laying hands. It is a uh, grabbing uh, with force so that he does not get away. Mm -hmm. And one of those who stood by drew his sword and struck the servant of the high priest and cut off his ear. Mm -hmm. Then Jesus entered and said to them, have you come out as against a robber with swords and clubs to take me? I was daily with you in the temple teaching, and you did not seize me, but the scriptures must be fulfilled. Then they all forsook him and fled. Mm. Now a certain young man followed him, having a linen cloth thrown around his, uh, around his naked body, and the young man laid hold of him, and he left the linen cloth and fled from them naked. 
Now, this is, we'll come back to this in a moment if, if we have time. Uh, the lesson brings this out, and I'd like to read from the lesson. Uh, it is shocking that one of Jesus' closest associates betrayed him to his enemies. The Gospels do not give, do not go into great detail about Judas's motivation, but E.G. White writes, Judas had naturally a strong love for money, but he had not always been corrupt enough to do such a deed as this. He had fostered the evil spirit of avarice until it had become the ruling motive in his life. The love of mammon overbalanced his love for Christ. Through becoming the slave of one vice, he gave himself to Satan to be driven to any length in sin. Now, you remembered, you remembered that at the supper, Jesus gave him a piece of bread or sop, as it says in the King James Version. It says, then the devil entered him. Now, uh, other instances in the Bible where the devil is, is enter somebody or somebody's demon possessed, they're foaming at the mouth, they're violent, they are doing horrible things, they're beating people up, whatever, horrible acts of violence. But this helps us to understand that somebody that is demon possessed can be apparently in composure mm -hmm. and a normal person. Right. We have to be careful with that. Now notice what it says in Psalm 41 verse nine. Yea, my own familiar friend in whom I trusted, which did eat of my bread, hath lifted up his heel against me. Mm -hmm. The devil made it as hard as possible mm -hmm. for Jesus. Uh, moving to John 12, 20, it says, and there were certain Greeks among them that came to worship at the feast. They, the same came therefore to Philip, which was of Bethsaida, Galilee, and desired him saying, sir, we would see Jesus. There's a reason why I'm quoting this. So these people were looking for Jesus mm -hmm. because they wanted to hear wonderful words of life. Uh, in Mark, in Matthew chapter two, verse one and two. Now, when Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, in the days of Herod, the king, behold, there came wise men from the east to Jerusalem saying, where is he that is born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east and are come to worship him. Mm -hmm. People were looking for Jesus to worship him, to hear words of life. But these people that came to the garden were not seeking for Jesus to worship him or seeking salvation or seeking healing. In John, four, uh, John 18, 4, it says, Jesus therefore knowing all things that should come upon him went forth and said unto them, whom seek ye? They answered him, Jesus of Nazareth, not for salvation, not for healing, but to bring destruction upon him. Jesus said unto them, I am he. And Judas also, which betrayed him, stood with them. As soon, as, as soon then as he has said unto them, I am he, they went backward and fell to the ground. Mm -hmm. Now, I didn't look this up, but in Desire of Ages, this idea that they fell to the ground, E.G. White says that divinity flashed mm -hmm. forth for a moment, and these people fell to the ground as uh, fainting from the... Uh, momentary glory that Jesus displayed. Uh, in Mark, we go back to Mark 14. We're talking about uh, the young man here at this point. Uh, it says, again, I was daily with you in the temple teaching and you did not seize me, but the scriptures must be fulfilled. Then they all forsook him and fled. Mm -hmm. Now a certain young man followed him, having a linen cloth thrown round about his naked body, and the young man laid hold of him, and he left the linen cloth and fled from them naked. Well, now, why is this here? Mm -hmm. You know, I've, I've pondered, why is this here? Mm -hmm. uh, it's a strange part of this, but anyway, the lesson brings this out. The disciples all flee, including Peter, who nevertheless will reappear following Jesus at a distance and ending up getting himself in trouble. But Mark 14, 51 and 52 tells of a young man following Jesus, an account found here and nowhere else in the canonical gospels. Some think it was Mark himself, but that is unprovable. What is remarkable is that he runs away naked. The young man, instead of leaving all to follow Jesus, leaves all to flee from Jesus. Mm -hmm. Now, I bring this to you. Uh, I don't want to dwell on this, but notice that Jesus, again, in John 18, 7, 8, and 9, this may be the reason why this idea of the young man is here. Then asked he then again, whom seek ye? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth, after they got up from 
uh, falling to the ground. Jesus answered, I have told you that I am he. If therefore you seek me, let these go their way, that the same might be fulfilled, which he spake of them, which thou gavest me, have I lost none. So this idea of this young man running away tells that they were trying to get this young man, gives you an idea that the mob would have also taken the disciples because Jesus said, let these go away. But apparently they had intentions of not only grabbing Jesus, but also the disciples, but Jesus appealed to them, let these go away. And this man, young man, took off running. So Jesus went through the most difficult experience we can imagine, all because he loves you and me. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Dinsey. This is a, a powerful lesson, which is worth our attention, spending as much time as we can thinking about what Jesus went through for us. My name is Daniel Perrin, and I have Thursday's lesson called, Who Are You? And we're covering 20 verses, the last 20 verses, starting in verse 53 of Mark 14. And I'm going to read most of them with you because I want to hear these straight as they were given to us. And they led Jesus away to the high priest. And with him were assembled all the chief priests, the elders and the scribes. But Peter followed him at a distance right into the courtyard of the high priest. And he sat with the servants and warmed himself at the fire. Now the chief priests and all the council sought testimony against Jesus to put him to death, but found none. For many bore false witness against him, but their testimonies did not agree. Then some rose up and bore false witness against him, saying, We heard him say, I will destroy this temple made with hands, and within three days I will build another made without hands. But not even then did their testimony agree. And the high priest stood up in the midst and asked Jesus, saying, Do you answer nothing? What is it these men testify against you? But he kept silent and answered nothing. Again, the high priest asked him, saying to him, Are you the Christ, the Son of the Blessed? Jesus said, I am. And you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the power and coming with the clouds of heaven. Then the high priest tore his clothes and said, What further need do we have of witnesses? You have heard the blasphemy. What do you think? And they all condemned him to be deserving of death. Then some began to spit on him, and to blindfold him, and to beat him, and to say to him, prophesy, and the officers struck him with the palms of their hands. I want you to notice, first of all, that Jesus is brought before the religious leaders. This is the Sanhedrin. These are the, 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 the top trained minds of the day, the sophisticated top thinkers. And this is what will be the experience of the faithful followers of Jesus. Their experience will parallel his. It will be religious leaders, religious people, trained, sophisticated, wise men and women of the world who will turn against their former brethren. Now this group here, the Sanhedrin, they need a, a legitimate appearing reason to put Jesus to death, at least in the eyes of the Jews. And so the Jewish council has gathered together before they bring Jesus to the Romans to give the appearance of legality. The purpose of the Jewish system was to prevent anyone from being condemned to death by rogue vigilante justice at the hands of jealousy. And so we find God's instructions sprinkled throughout the books of Moses and then developed within Jewish society until at the time of Jesus, this was the rule. The trial was not to happen at night so that no sleepiness would cloud the mind, no shadow would hide the truth on the face. There was to be no defense attorney because the council was the defense attorney. They were the ones to defend and look for, look for the truth, the reasons to, uh, to, uh, to acquit the accused. The execution of the sentence was not to happen on the same day. Uh, so they should go home and fast and pray and say, Lord, is there a reason to acquit the guilty person or the accused person? and no, no witnesses could disagree or the trial would automatically be thrown out in favor of the accused. But none of these things was the case for Jesus. 
because he had threatened their place of honor in society and their role as the interpreters of scripture and their authority over the temple and their man-made rules. And after all, he had no education. He had no training, but he did have the power of God. And the Jewish leaders recognized that and they knew that they lacked that power of God. So now they will do absolutely anything to get out of Jesus the confession that they need, and they need it on a timetable. It's got to be here, and it's got to be now. And so in verse 50, finally, the high priest asks the pivotal question, Are you the Christ? And Jesus responds, I am. I want you to notice that the real issue here is Jesus' identity. Who are you? Jesus was not put to death for the things he said, for the things he did, but for who he was. It is who he is. And that's what the whole great controversy surrounds. The character, the identity of Jesus as our loving creator, savior, and the ruler of this universe. Now I have to point out again that the same thing will be true of Jesus' followers before Jesus returns that those who want to kill Jesus' followers will be enraged at them because of who they are, because they also reflect the character of Jesus, which is so hated by Satan and his angels. I want to go now to the next part, the story of Peter, which was begun in verse 54, which continues now, verse 66. Now, as Peter was below in the courtyard, one of the servant girls of the high priest came. I'm going to skip down to verse 70 here just to make sure I have enough time. Peter denies Jesus twice. But now verse 70, he denied it again. And a little later, those who stood by said to Peter again, surely you are one of them for you are a Galilean. Your speech shows it. Then he began to curse and swear. I do not know this man of whom you speak. Once again, the issue here is Jesus' identity. Peter's security is threatened. He's backed into a corner and he has to make a decision of loyalty. And this again is the condition that that God's followers will face at the end of time. Security threatened, backed into a corner, have to make a decision of loyalty. And and Peter says this, "Well, well, we say, I would never do what Peter did. That's exactly what he said. And we just don't know what's really in us. And so God allows trial and temptation to reveal the heart. And hear this statement in Review and Herald, article by Ellen White, June 6, 1884. Some seek to control their surroundings, thinking that if they are placed in favorable positions, the bad traits of character will not be developed. But God orders our surroundings and he will place us where we shall have test after test to prove us and to reveal what is in our hearts. That's right. James 1 verses 2 and 3 says the same thing. My brethren, count it all joy. Count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. This is all in God's plan and his will so that we will be brought face to face with the things that we have denied. We, we, we don't want to pull up those things in our heart. We know it's in there, but we think if I don't ever, here it is in parenting, God, I can testify to this. God has given me children and those children have revealed what already is true in my heart. I'm a very selfish and impatient person. God says, I brought that to you and I'm going to keep bringing it to you so that you can recognize your great need of me. Peter now sees that. And I want you to listen to the contrast between Peter and Jesus. Jesus boldly declares when his life is on the line and he could say anything else, he boldly declares his identity. I am the Christ. And you have to notice that Jesus admits this boldly publicly when there is no chance of him setting up a human kingdom. He didn't say that before boldly and publicly as he is now, but he does. Now, Peter, on the other hand, he boldly declares with cursing and swearing, I do not know the man. 
I've never heard of him. I've never seen him. I've never heard his teachings. I've never seen his miracles. He hasn't changed my life. I'm the same person I always was. The last three and a half years never happened. He didn't wash my feet. I don't know the man. Will we do the same thing that Peter did? We go to church. We have a religious life. But the path is going to get narrow. It's going to get so narrow that you are going to have to make a decision between your life and your loyalty to Christ. And we often say, and we're tested on this over and over right now, will we take the safe route or the route of loyalty to Christ? He hasn't changed my life. I'm going to trust my own judgment. We may not curse and swear, but so often we don't let him form our character by revealing what's in our hearts. Peter had a second chance. Those who face the same situation before Jesus returns, they have all the light behind them. Peter did not have all that light yet, and their decision will be final. I pray that God will give us the strength and we will accept that strength to boldly declare our loyalty to Christ as he did for us. Wow, thank you so much. Wow, this lesson, I mean, when you talk about the crucifixion of Christ, I can see it really moved you, Jill. You know, I, th I think that when we recognize there's so much of the gospel, but if Christ is not the central focus, it really doesn't transform us. Ryan, well, how could you summarize your day for us? Amen. You know, I just want to read verse 8 of Isaiah 53, which I didn't get to read earlier. It says, He was taken from prison and from judgment, and who will declare his generation? For he was cut off from the land of the living. For the transgression of my people, he was stricken. Praise God for Jesus Christ. Amen. In the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus carried the weight of sin for you. He endured separation from God for you. He accepted God's no for you. He walked alone for you. Amen, amen. Jesus was taken captive for you and for me, and because of this, you and I have the opportunity of salvation. Mark chapter 14 ends with these words, and when he thought about it, this is Peter, he wept. And we know that after that, Peter is restored by Jesus. Mm -hmm. Well, well, I just thank you so much, every one of you, for bringing that out. The lesson was uh, taken and tried. And I like what you brought out, uh, Daniel, that each one of us will have our characters revealed so that we can see who Christ is. The most unforgettable thing about Christ was the words at the cross, remember me when you come in the kingdom. We pray that Christ will be in your life. You will be remembered by him when he comes. Look forward to seeing your next lesson, Tried and Crucified.